On January 2nd, 1935, a man using a fake name checked into a Kansas City hotel. Throughout his stay, a string of mysterious activity would take place until his battered body was found in his room days later. He used his last breath to tell authorities that this was just an accident. Nobody did this to him. However, his injuries showed he was definitely attacked. For almost a decade, what happened in this room and to this man has baffled police and the true crime community. Who attacked this man and why has it puzzled police for years? This is the story of the creepy murder in room 1046. On January 2nd, 1935, a man checked into the hotel president in Kansas under the name Roland T. Owen. The bellboy, Randolph Probst, helped Owen up to his bedroom and noticed that Owen was nicely dressed, wearing a dark overcoat, but weirdly, he didn't have any bags on him. And when they went up into the room, Owen started <laughs> unpacking, I guess, and he only had three items in his pockets, a hairbrush, a comb, and toothpaste. The hotel staff also reported that he appeared in his early 20s, but maybe early 30s. He had a very noticeable and uniquely shaped scar on his temple, and he also had cauliflower ear. So they thought he was a professional boxer because most of the hotel president clientele was prestigious or wealthy people. They actually had, and it's reported when you look into this case, Frank Sinatra sang and performed in their lounge room. So I'm pretty sure it meant that prestigious people were there. It might have just been a one performance from Frank Sinatra and they were like, this is a place where the stars come. And it's like, they only showed up once, but okay. It was also claimed that Roland T. Owen put his address as Los Angeles, so they thought he was from LA. Weirdly, he also requested a room on the top floor and that the room could be inside facing so that way the hotel wasn't facing the street but rather a room where it would face like the courtyard or would actually be in the middle of the hotel so it wasn't outside which was interesting and a lot of people noted that that it's just a little weird how he requested a very specific room after Probst led Owen to his hotel room where Owen air quotes unpacked his amount of belongings he then said okay you can go back downstairs I'm good here and then Owen actually followed him back out and he was still wearing his large dark overcoat Mary Soap Dick a hotel maid had started her shift later that afternoon. When she arrived at room 1046, she noticed the lights were dim and the shades were drawn. Soapdick was even more shocked because Owen was actually in the room sitting in the darkness. Owen told Soapdick that she could clean the room while he stayed there, eventually getting up a few minutes later and left. But he asked her to leave the door unlocked when she would leave, adding that he was expecting company later on. Soapdick left and came back later in the night and entered the room to find Owen fully clothed, laying on the bed, and it was completely dark again, no lights, all the curtains were drawn. She found this weird, and then she noticed that there was a note on the nightstand. And through the hallway light, she could make out that it said, Don, I will be back in 15 minutes. Wait. And then she left. So now there's a mysterious man named Don in the picture. It seems like this is the person that Owen would possibly be meeting up with, as he mentioned to Mary before he left that he was going to have some company. And then with that letter, it makes it seem like he's traveling with another person, potentially. But things just kept getting weirder. So the next morning, it's January 3rd, 1935, Mary Soapdick went to go clean room 1046 and found it locked. The doors can only be locked from the outside, so this made Soapdick think that Owen was out. As someone is leaving the hotel, then they can lock the hotel door. It is a little weird that these hotel doors can't lock from the inside and that they only lock from the outside. I guess hotels were just like that at that time. I guess during that time period and that era, you didn't really feel the need to lock the door as much as we do now. I don't know, it was just strange. So yeah, she thought that, oh, the door is locked. It can only lock it from the outside. The person in this room must be out, so I'll just use my key. So she did just that, she used her own key. She made herself into the room and found something shocking. Owen was in the room. 
still sitting in the same spot as she had found him yesterday afternoon. The phone rang while she was there and Owen answered it. Soptik heard him say while she was cleaning, No, Don, I don't want to eat. I am not hungry. I just had breakfast. And then repeated again, No, I am not hungry. Soptik left and then came back to put more towels in the room later that day, and she reported that she heard two voices talking to each other pretty loudly. Soptik asked if they needed fresh towels, to which a deep voice, not that of Owens, replied, No, we don't need towels. Soptik found this odd because she took the towels in the morning and was going to replace them on this trip. The woman staying in the room next door also told police that voices were shouting and cursing. However, it should also be reported that there was a party that night in room 1055, and she's never confirmed if the noise could have come from 1046 or was from the party at 1055. The next morning, a switchboard operator, Della Ferguson, came on clock and was scheduled to make a requested wake-up call to room 1046, but she noticed that the phone had been taken off the hook. So someone was then sent to check on the room, and it was the bellboy from earlier, Randolph Propes. He noticed that the door was locked with the Do Not Disturb sign on. When he called out and knocked on the door, a deep voice kept saying, Come in. Open the door. But the door remained locked. After knocking once more, the voice said, turn on the lights. Then Propes just shouted, I think he just didn't really know what to do in this situation or probably didn't have a key to the room, but he just shouted like, put the phone back on the line and then left and thought that was the end of it. Around two hours later at 8.30 a.m., another bellboy, Harold Pike, was sent up to the room with a key when the phone was still not put back on the hook. Pike opened the door and found Owen naked, laying on the bed, and unresponsive. Thinking that he was just drunk and not sure exactly what to do, he left. But Pike also told police later he noticed dark splotches around him. Two hours later, at 10.30 a.m., the phone was still not on the hook, so Probst went back up to check, only to find an eerie scene that would create the mystery behind room 1046. When Randolph Probst opened the room to 1046, he discovered Owen was laying on the floor on all fours in front of the door with blood all over his head. Probst even noticed that he was kind of laying in a way where he was like on all fours, so on his knees and elbows with his arms like outstretched and holding his head to hold even more blood. Probst ran down the stairs in terror and tried to find help. When he returned, the door was blocked. Somehow, Owen got up and barred the door closed with his body. Probst was then able to convince him to stand up, allowing doctors and bellboys to enter the room, and what they found was even more confusing. Owen was found with cord around his wrist, ankles, and neck. He was covered in blood, and there was blood spatter all over the main room and bathroom. Some blood was even on the ceiling from his head injury. He was also clearly stabbed multiple times and was clearly attacked somehow, but Owen kept claiming that he simply slipped on the bathtub. When asked who hurt him, he just said, nobody. They found more bruising around his neck, suggesting that Owen was strangled or choked, but more in addition to the cord around his neck. He was then rushed to the nearest hospital, where he slipped into a coma, and unfortunately passed away just after midnight on January 5th, 1935. It seems to police and doctors there that this is potentially a homicide, especially based off of the injuries. After his autopsy, it was revealed that he was fatally stabbed and bludgeoned, but based on the dried blood, he was attacked around 4 or 5 in the morning, which means that he would have been like dying or bleeding out during that time that the bellhops were coming to check on the phone throughout the morning. This also means that the voice that Probst heard in the morning at 8.30, three hours after Owen would have been attacked, may have been the elusive killer. Or it could have also been Owen laying in bed disoriented. When Pike went to check on the room, the dark splotches on the blood he saw was actually from Owen. It was his blood pooling while he was bleeding out unconsciously. Those staying at the hotel that night said they didn't see anything suspicious or out of the ordinary. They also didn't find any luggage or clothing in the dresser or closet in room 1046. 
Even weirder, all of the hotel essentials, such as like shampoo, soap, and towels, were all missing. The police found diluted sulfuric acid in the room, as well as a tag from a necktie made in New Jersey. They also found a few hairpins and an unlit cigarette, but hardly anything else. Even more weirdly though, they found some fingerprints on the phone that didn't match anyone who would have been in and out of that room. So they are unidentified fingerprints, but believe believed to be from a female. There was also no weapon in the room or a sharp object like a knife found, so this ruled out the suicide attempt theory completely. The court around Owen suggests a homicide, and with the murder weapon missing, this also suggests that there was obviously someone else in the room. When trying to reach out to LA to find next of kin or notify someone that he had died, they couldn't find any record of a Roland T. Owen living in Los Angeles. So police realized that he had given a fake name to the hotel. Probst recalled Owen mentioning his stay at the Malbach Hotel before he checked into the hotel president and claimed that the first hotel was too expensive. Interestingly, Mary Soapdick, the maid from earlier, also claimed that Owen would complain about the hotel's prices to her too. Detectives then interviewed the Malbach Hotel staff, who said that no Roland T. Owen checked into their hotel, but a man named Eugene K. Scott gave a Los Angeles address and also requested an interior room. It seems that Owen was checking into hotels with different names. LAPD claimed that there was no one in their city under the new alias that they discovered either. The murder was then printed on the front page of local newspapers, and the body of Owen was kept at the McGilley Memorial where locals came to see the body, but none were able to identify him, which led police to start a national search for his identity. One person claimed that they might have seen Owen the night before he died run out into the alleyway. The person, a city worker named Robert Lane, was in his work car when he saw a man dressed in a white tank top, pants and shoes, running down the street, the direction from the hotel, flagging him down. The man opened the car door and apologized, thinking that Robert Lane's car was a taxi, but Lane shrugged it off and just said that he would be able to take him to a cab. He noticed that the strange man was in, air quotes, rough shape, an air quote. He was cursing under his breath and was seemingly irritated saying things like, oh, I could kill him tomorrow or oh, I'm gonna get him. Like kind of like that sort of like frustrated stuff. And he was also holding an arm and Lane noticed that there was a giant deep scratch there. Once he found a cab, the man got out of the car and ran off to the taxi and Lane just drove away. When Lane went to the funeral home, he claims that he saw the same scratch on Owen's arm that was on the strange man man's arm from that night and believes that he may have picked Owen up. This lead actually really didn't go anywhere and honestly I personally think he may have picked up the man who killed Owen instead. The President Hotel also said that they didn't see anyone, especially Owen, really like enter or leave during that time so they really don't think that this could be a promising lead. However, they don't know who snuck into their hotel so I don't know if we can really take their word or I think we should take it with a little bit of a grain of salt if you will. So on March 3rd that year the funeral was commencing. So newspapers announced on March 3rd, 1935 that the mysterious body would be buried in the city's potter's field the next day. However, that day, the funeral home received a call from a man who asked for the funeral to be postponed so they could have enough time to send money to another funeral home for the service and burial to take place there instead, which was Memorial Park Cemetery in Kansas City, Kansas. The caller also added that they'd like to bury Roland T. Owen there so the dead man could be close to his sister. When the funeral home asked why Owen was killed or if he knew how he had died, the caller then revealed that Owen had an affair while he was engaged. The caller and the two women that Owen allegedly cheated on arranged to meet him at the President Hotel to get revenge. The caller said before hanging up, quote, cheaters usually get what's coming to them, unquote. The funeral was postponed, and then on March 23rd, the funeral home received an envelope with no return address or return person, but enough money to cover the expenses. They sent $25, which today would have been $500. Local florists also received phone calls and two envelopes with $5 each for a bouquet of 13 American Beauty roses to be at the funeral. 
This time there was a card left in the envelopes with a note that read, quote, Love forever, Louise, unquote. The handwriting was shown to be disguised and the phone calls were from payphones. So this lead never really panned out. They didn't really find anything from this. The funeral was then held where detectives who worked the case were pallbearers, but other detectives posed as grave diggers in case the mysterious donors arrived. But no one came to the service or days after. Apparently, a news station covered that the man was buried in a pauper's grave, but a mysterious woman called in to say that he was given a proper burial. Asking for more information, the woman simply said, quote, Never mind, I know what I'm talking about, unquote, and then hung up. The case then, unfortunately, went cold, and unfortunately, stayed cold. Almost two years after the murder, a woman named Ruby Ogletree called the Kansas City Police. Apparently, her friend saw the murder in a magazine and thought the man in the photo looked just like Ruby's son. After identifying the scars on the body, the body had finally been identified. The man was Artemis Ogletree and was actually just a boy, murdered coldly at the age of 17. Ruby said that her son left home in 1934 to travel with a friend named Joe Simpson. They were planning to hitchhike throughout the country. Apparently, Ruby's answers to questions about her son only raised more questions. She said that she actually received letters from her son the last few years the last few years that he's been dead, and that's why they didn't seem worried that he may have been missing. In 1935, Ruby received a typed letter postmarked from Chicago. This made her suspicious because she claims that her son didn't know how to type, as all the letters previously were all handwritten. Even stranger, this letter used more advanced language, where Ruby claimed that Artemis spoke more simply. Letters then came in from New York claiming that Artemis was going to Europe and another about when his ship was departing. A few months later, in August, Artemis has been dead for at least eight months by the way, Ruby received a phone call from a man in Memphis, Tennessee. The caller talked to Ruby for about half an hour on how Artemis had saved his life. The caller claimed that Artemis was now living in Cairo, Egypt and married a wealthy woman. The reason he couldn't write to Ruby anymore was because when he was saving the caller's life, Artemis lost one of his thumbs, which I don't know about losing phalanges, but I feel like if you lose one thumb, you can write with like the rest of your four fingers. Like, I don't, I mean, it is unfortunate. Don't get me wrong. That would be a bummer for sure. And I'm so sorry to people who have lost fingers and limbs. That is so tragic and I'm so sorry. But I also feel like Artemis could have come through with some adversity there, been able to write a letter to his mom, but I don't know. That was just an interesting story to me, and I was like, I don't think you'd be put that far back. Ruby claimed that the man spoke erratically and irrationally, but seemed to know first-hand knowledge about her son. The police checked the U.S. Embassy and the steamship that the caller claims they traveled on, but no Artemis Ogletree has been reported to have traveled. Ruby also disclosed the name of the caller to police, but the name has never been publicly revealed. And unfortunately, that seems to be all the information, all of the facts of the case that I can present to you. But now we're going to get into the theories surrounding the case. It's believed that Ogletree was engaged to a woman, but cheated on her. His fiancé's brother or friend set up a plan to get revenge for the woman believed to be Louise, the one who sent the flowers for the funeral. So it's believed that Ogletree was dating or engaged to this Louise person, the one who sent the flowers for the funeral, and because he cheated on her, maybe her brother or like a close friend to her, they kind of set up a way to get revenge for what happened to Louise by killing Ogletree in his hotel room. And a lot of people theorize that the man who worked with Luis to exact this revenge was maybe the man that the city worker Robert Lane, he got in his car. But the only evidence to corroborate this theory is the letter with Luis's name and the weird phone calls. This theory doesn't really make much sense to me as Artemis used a fake name and I wonder if this was a case of mistaken identity maybe because he was using a fake name. I didn't know if they were tracking someone named Roland T. Owen and because he used that name they were like this is our guy, let's kill this guy but it was actually Artemis Ogletree instead and so I wonder if Artemis may have accidentally chose the name of a man cheated on his fiance and was accidentally killed for it. This theory also is not the one that police really latched onto, 
because again there's limited evidence and a lot of crime magazines were reporting on this case during the time and a lot of people who were reading these magazines were writing in their theories and this was kind of the main theory that the community chose and really wanted to have looked into but I really don't think this theory has a lot of weight compared to the other theories that we're going to get into. Ruby Ogletree gave the place more information. There was one other hotel in Kansas that Artemis stayed at. It was called the St. Regis in Kansas City, and he stayed with another man. However, it was never proven if this man was quote-unquote Don or not. It's also been theorized that Don is the one who killed Artemis, but Don wasn't Artemis's friend, but rather a sadistic killer on the loose. Apparently, a man named Joseph Ogden was convicted of killing his roommate, Oliver George Sinical, by shooting him in the head with a pistol, then dismembering the body, and then putting the body in a suitcase with express shipping to another state. The suitcase was opened en route and Ogden was found out when the suitcase had the address numbers on it that matched his house numbers. Ogden then broke down to police and admitted to the killing. It was also discovered that he used the alias Donald Kelso, which also matched a name in the President Hotel's guest registry the night Ogletree checked in. However, this was strictly a coincidence and no Don or Donald Kelso has ever really been identified and the police said that Joseph Ogden's signature and handwriting did not match the handwriting that was in the guest registry, so this theory also went cold. Ruby Ogletree believes that her son was killed by the boy he left home to travel with, Joe Simpson. According to Kansas City Magazine, who went through the case file in the murder, Ruby had lots of letters to police asking for them to look into Joe. The police claimed that they had and that she shouldn't worry about Simpson as it wasn't turning into a promising lead. Ruby then investigated on her own and tried to meet up with Simpson, who kept standing her up every time a meeting would be established. Ruby was then able to confront Simpson on December 28, 1939, and wrote their conversation to the Kansas police, stating that, quote, He did say and he did believe the case would never break, as there were no clues and left nothing for the police to work on. He laughed and said, They'll never get the ones who killed him, unquote. Ruby claims that she then looked him in the eyes and said, quote, I know the voice that talked to me from Memphis, unquote, implying that Simpson was a mysterious caller after her son's death. Ruby said that he dropped his eyes and appeared nervous before the two went separate ways. It seems that the mysterious letters, calls, and Joe Simpson were never investigated by police, unfortunately. Apparently, even worse, Simpson promised Ruby that he'd pass her a letter from Artemis, but claimed it was badly typed. As mentioned, Ogletree was seen with cauliflower ear, leading people to believe he was a boxer. Apparently, he was seen asking around the area about wrestling fights. It's believed that Artemis may have been employed as a fighter through the mob and was losing his fights, which meant he was losing money for those he would fight under. It's believed that the mysterious Don may not have been an actual name, but the name he called his mafia boss, which is a common title that gangsters call their bosses. This may also be why Artemis said that nobody attacked him, because he was afraid of saying mafia names. It's also believed that the mafia then sent letters to his mother to throw off suspicion, and Artemis may have known that they knew where his mom lived and didn't want to put her life in danger by ratting them out. It was also noted that sulfuric acid was one of the only items found in the room, and it's been noted that the mafia tend to use sulfuric acid to get rid of fingerprints or other evidence. Those who committed crimes in the mafia are also good about covering their tracks, and that's why there was nothing else found in the room. The murder does seem to be somewhat premeditated, or at least there was a bit of planning in the cleanup to avoid suspicion. Maybe Joe Simpson did kill Artemis, but couldn't say anything because he was also a part of the mafia. Maybe they both left together to become fighters in the crime world, but unfortunately, only one came out alive. 
I don't know if this case will ever be solved, which is really unfortunate. And it's unfortunate how he passed away. I'm glad his mom was able to have some closure around the death and that his body could have been identified. Let me know what you thought of this case in this episode. I'd love to hear you guys' thoughts, especially regarding all of the weird theories that we talked about. I hope you guys have a great rest of your week. I can't wait to see you next week for another video. Bye.